Hello, this is Ben with the Green Hill, and I uh, had a friend email me a, a really cool email about some of the Native American Second Coming prophecies and uh, Millennium prophecies. So I thought it was very interesting, and I figured I'd share it with you guys. And also for me, it's just more evidence and confirmation that the Book of Mormon indeed happened here in the Promised Land in America. Um, so this is a you know the Book of Mormon people here in America, and they speak of the millennium. So let's get right into the, this uh, email. He said, here are some Native American quotes that I believe refer to the millennium. And he gives three different instances. This is the first one. At the beginning of this cycle of time, long ago, the Great Spirit came down and he made an appearance and he gathered the peoples of this earth together. They say on an island which is now beneath the water. And he said to the human beings, I am going to send you to four directions. And over time, I'm going to change you to four colors. But I'm going to give you some teachings. And you will call these the original teachings. And when you come back together with each other, you will share these so that you can live and have peace on earth. And a great civilization will come about. And this was a prophecy as told by Lee Brown of the Salish tribe at the 1986 Continental Indigenous Council uh, in Alaska. Pretty cool. Here's the second one. There will come a day when people of all races, colors, and creeds will put aside their differences. They will come together in love, joining hands in unification to heal the earth and all her children. They will move over the earth like a great whirling rainbow, bringing peace, understanding, and healing everywhere they go. Many creatures thought to be extinct or mythical will resurface at this time. The great trees that perished will return almost overnight. All living things will flourish, drawing sustenance from the uh, breast of our mother, the earth. The great spiritual teachers who walked the earth and taught the basics of the truths of the whirling rainbow prophecy will return and walk amongst, amongst us once more, sharing their power and understanding with all. We will learn how to see and hear in a sacred manner. Men and women will be equals in the way Creator intended them to be. All children will be safe anywhere they want to go. Elders will be respected and valued for their contributions to life. Their wisdom will be sought out. The, human, the whole human race will be called the people, and there will be no more war, sickness, or hunger forever. And that's the Navajo Hopi prophecy of the whirling rainbow. All right, here's the third one about the millennium. In the time of the seventh fire, a new people would emerge. They would retrace their steps to find the wisdom that was left by the side of the trail long ago. Their steps would take them to the elders, who they would ask to guide them on their journey. If the new people remain strong in their quest, the sacred drum will again sound its voice. There will be an awakening of the people, and the sacred fire will again be lit. At this time, the light-skinned race will be given a choice between two roads. One road is the road of greed and technology, without wisdom or respect for life. This road represents a rush to destruction. The other road is spirituality a slower path that includes respect for all living things. If we choose the spiritual path, we can light oh, so, yeah, we can light yet another fire, an eighth fire, and begin an extended period of peace and holy healthy growth. And that's from Grandfather William Commanda, Circle of All Nations Prophecy of the Seven Fires of the Anishinaabe from ancient Wampum belt. Uh, pretty cool, I thought. 
Uh, he also says in this email, he says, references to the new era, a golden age, um, are characterized by harmony, stability, and prosperity. The, and these do not just belong to the Native Americans, but can be found in myths and legends from all over the world. It is known as Chrysan Genos in the Greek mythology, the Kali Yuga in Vedic and Hindu culture, and the Golard in Norse mythology. One aspect that is common among many legends of the Golden Era is the return of beings or gods that will aid in the restoration of the earth. And we would say, you know, the return of resurrected beings helping to usher in the millennium. So I thought that was pretty awesome. I'm sure there's more. If you know of more, let me know. He also shared in this email um, a PDF about the Hopi. And the Hopi are, are an awesome tribe. Um, Hugh Nibley actually spent a lot of time with them and he really admired and respected their culture. And once Hugh Nibley, he was asked, it was kind of a, it was kind of like a, you know, in a mocking way or, or kind of trick. I mean, he, he was basically asked, Hey, you know, isn't the temple ceremonies of Latter-day Saints similar to the, the Masonic Lodge? And it was kind of like, you know, a slight like, oh, you know, didn't Joseph just copy this? And Hugh Nibley, being super wise, said, actually, the the thing that is closest to the temple ceremonies is the, you know, the ritual dances of the Hopi tribe. And they for sure didn't get it from the Masons. So basically he's saying like, look, there's crossover in these and it's for a reason it's because there's uh, great truths uh, that are um, within and, and have been passed down. So let me get this uh, cool, um, you know, little tidbit about the, the Hopi tribe. I think you'll really like it. So the Hopi, the first section is, well, he says in the Hopi mythos, the word worlds is often used to reference an amount of time while simultaneously representing a civilization, country, or people. So the first section, creation and origination, uh, known as the four worlds. All right, it says, Hopi legend tells that the current earth is the fourth world in the inhabited, oh, the fourth world to be inhabited by Tawas or God's creations. Their story essentially states that in each previous world, and in our term, I would think um, dispensation would be a good uh, thing to put there. The people, though originally happy, became disobedient and lived contrary to Tawa's plan. So this is like the beginning of apostasy in each of these dispensations or worlds. They engaged in sexual promisc uh, promiscuity, fought one another, and would not live in harmony. Thus, the most obedient were led to the next higher world with physical changes occurring both in the people and in the course of their journey and in the environment of the next world. In some stories, these former worlds were then destroyed along with the wicked inhabitants. So think of like Noah and the flood or the Jaredites. Uh, the Jewish nation after Christ. And then he continues, whereas in others, the good people were simply led away from the chaos, which had been created by their actions. So he's talking about these different worlds, different dispensations, how they, they start out good, they're doing great, and then they, you know, stop obeying the plan of, of Tawa or God. And they start falling into this apostasy and some of them are destroyed and some of them are let out. And that's, you know, a, a theme that we see time and time again throughout the Old Testament, uh, throughout the Book of Mormon. Uh, so I really like that. He continues, Tawa destroyed the third world in a great flood. Okay, we know which one that is. And before the destruction, the more righteous people were sealed into holy reeds 
which were used as boats. Upon arriving on a small piece of dry land, the people saw nothing around them but more water. Even after planting a large bamboo shoot, climbing to the top and looking about, they were then told to make boats out of more reeds and using island stepping stones along the way, the people sailed east until they eventually arrived on the mountains, mountainous coast of the fourth world. Okay, uh, the next section is called Migrations. Upon the arrival of the fourth world, the Hopis divided and went on a series of great migrations throughout the land. Sometimes they would stop and build a town, then abandon it to continue on with the migration. However, they would leave their symbols behind in the rocks to show that the Hopi had been there. Long the divided people uh, wandered in groups of families, eventually forming clans named after an event or sign that a particular group received upon its journey. These clans would travel for some time uh, as a unified community, but almost inevitably a disagreement would occur, the clan would split, and each portion would go its separate way. Uh, however, as the clans traveled, they would often join together forming large groups, only to have these associations disband and then be reformed with other clans. Uh, that's basically describing the pride cycle in the Book of Mormon. Um, these alternate periods of harmonious living followed by wickedness, contention, and separation play an important part of the Hopi mythos. Uh, think of that pattern in the Book of Mormon. This pattern seemingly uh, began in the first world and continues uh, even into recent history. In the course of their migration, each Hopi clan was to go to the furthest extremity of the land in every direction. Far in the north was a land of snow and ice, which was called the back door, but this was closed to the Hopi. However, the Hopi say that other peoples came through the back door into the fourth world. This back door is referring to the Bering Land Bridge, which connected Asia uh, with the far North America. Okay, the second part is called Sacred Hopi Tablets. Hopi tradition tells of sacred tablets which were imparted to the Hopi by various deities. I would say various prophets. Uh, you think of how the scriptures were handed down uh, through prophets from generation to generation. Like most of Hopi myth mythology, accounts differ as to when the tablets were given and in precisely what manner. Perhaps the most important was said to be in the possession of the fire clan and is related to the return of the Pahana, or Christ. In one version, an elder of the fire clan worried that his people would not recognize the Pahana when he returned from the east. He therefore etched various designs, including a human figure, into a stone. Um, so he goes on, this same story holds that three other sacred tablets were also given to the Hopi. These were given to the Bear Clan by the prophet Sokom Hona, and essentially constituted a divine title to the lands where the Hopi settled after their migrations. A letter from the Hopi to the President of the United States in 1949 also declared that the stone tablets upon which are written the boundaries of the Hopi Empire are still in the hands of the chiefs of Oribe and Hotivilla Pueblos. Christian missionaries, they attempted to present the argument that they were the true Pahana, the lost white-robed brother, returned to translate the Hopi tablets. Yet none knew the handshake of the brotherhood or the sacred path of the corn seeds as seen on the Hopi tablets.
So the Hopi were not fooled into thinking that, you know, the the Christian missionaries or, um, you know, white people coming over were their pahana, um, similar to how people in South America were fooled, you know, thinking that the conquistadors were their, you know, great white bearded God. Pretty interesting. Okay, let's keep moving on. Okay, the Hopi Pahana or Jesus Christ. The true Pahana or Bahana is the lost white brother of the Hopi. Most versions have it that the Pahana or elder brother left for the east at the time that the Hopi entered the fourth world and began their migrations. However, the Hopi say that he will return again and at his coming, the wicked will be destroyed and a new age of peace, the fifth world, will be ushered into the world. As mentioned above, it is said he will bring with him a missing section of a sacred Hopi stone in the possession of the fire clan, and that he will come wearing red. Traditionally, Hopis are buried facing eastward in expectation of the Pahana who will come from that direction. So pretty awesome that, uh, you know, Pahana, Jesus Christ will return from the east wearing red, uh, just like what we believe. Also that, uh, you know, sacred missing um, tablets will be returned. Uh, we also believe that a sealed portion of the, the Book of Mormon will come forth. He continues in this section about Pahana. This figure bears a striking striking resemblance of figures also of uh, Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent in Mexico. In the early 16th century, both the Hopis and the Aztecs believed that the coming of the Spanish conquistadors was the return of this lost white prophet. Unlike the Aztecs, upon first contact, the Hopi put the Spanish through a series of tests in order to determine their divinity. And having failed, the Spanish were sent away from the Hopi Mesas. Right, next section. The Hopi Religious Rituals, Temple Rites. As folklorist uh, Harold Portland, uh, Corlander states, quote, there is a Hopi uh, resistance about discussing matters that could be considered ritual secrets or religion-oriented traditions. David Roberts continues that, quote, The secrecy that lies at the heart of Puebloan, including Hopi life, along, long predates European contact, forming an intrinsic feature of the culture, end quote. So there are parallels between Book of Mormon rituals and those of the Hopi, including an initiation ritual regarding parts of the body and the pronouncement of blessings. Parallels appear between the language of the Mormon temple ceremony and the Hopi myths of origin. Here's the part about Hugh Nibley. It says, responding to someone who asked about similarities between the Mormon temple endowment and the Masonic ceremony, Nibley wrote that the parallels between the Mormon endowment and the rites of the Hopi come closest of all as far as I have been able to discover. And where did they get theirs? So basically like, yeah, like where did the Hopi get theirs? It wasn't from the Masons. And that was in uh, Boyd J. Peterson's Hugh Nibley, A Consecrated Life. So I thought that was pretty awesome. Also, you know, along those lines, we got this from Wayne May. This is the Ojibwa or the Chippewa dance aprons. And, uh, you know, their ceremonial aprons are pretty symbolic. Okay, he continues in his his letter, and this is awesome right here. This is uh, Hopi Prophecies, the nine signs before Pahana will return. So let's go over each of these signs. Number one, the first sign. 
We are told of the coming of the white-skinned men like Pahana, but not living like Pahana, men who took the land that was not theirs, and men who struck their enemies with thunder. So that definitely occurred. This, you know, some pictures of the Trail of Tears. Uh, their land was taken from them, and um, you know, he describes rifles as you know striking with thunder. Prophecy number two. This is the second sign. Our lands will see the coming of spinning wheels filled with voices. In his youth, my father saw this prophecy come true with his eyes. The white men bringing their families in wagons across the prairies. And these are some uh, some pictures of the, the pioneers, you know, crossing the prairies with their wagons and hand carts. Prophecy number three. This is the third sign. A strange beast like a buffalo, but with great long horns, will overrun the land in large numbers. These white men's buffalo, father saw with his eyes the coming of the white men's cattle. Prophecy number four. This is the fourth sign. The land will be crossed by snakes of iron. And that was the railroad age. And, you know, crossing the entire United States with uh, railroads. Prophecy number five uh, this is the fifth sign. The land shall be crisscrossed by a giant spider's web. You know, some might think this might be uh, telephone lines or it could be the Internet. Um, I think both of those are could be great representations of this sign. All right, prophecy number six. The sixth sign. The land shall be crisscrossed with rivers of stone that make pitchers in the sun. You know, rivers of stone, I thought of just highways across the country. And pitchers in the sun, I was thinking, you know, large buildings by these highways. And when the sun's up, casting their shadows onto these, um, these highways. Prophecy number seven. This is the seventh sign. You will hear of the sea turning black and many living things dying because of it. And you, know, you could just think of oil spills. Prophecy number eight. This is the eighth sign. You will see many youth who wear their hair long like my people come and join the tribal nations to learn their ways and wisdom. Uh, you know, I. I was thinking of the 60s and 70s with the hippie generation and their reverence that they had for um, Native American. I also thought, you know, wearing wearing their hair is long. A little bit of what we see nowadays with, uh, you know, transgenderism and things like that. Um, prophecy number nine. And this is the ninth and last sign. You will hear of a dwelling place in the heavens above the earth that shall fall with a great crash. It will appear as a blue star. Very soon after this, the ceremonies of my people will cease. And to me, that sounded a lot like the sign of the Son of Man, which will uh, happen during the opening of the seventh seal when... Um, Christ is anointed king at the New Jerusalem, and at that time we'll see a, a great, there'll be a great sign in heaven. It'll basically be like people will think it's a, a planet, um, but it's the, the return of the city of Enoch, and um, that will be making its way towards the earth. So I thought that was really cool. I hope you liked it. If there are any other, you know, Native American prophecies or uh, statements that refer to either the second coming or the millennium, please share. I'd love to hear it.